Hey y'all, it's Kelsey. Thank you for joining me again today. For those of you who have subscribed, I love you. I may be in love with you. I don't know yet. We're going to find out. Of course, I chose the busiest time of year to try to start this channel. So I'm already running behind on my schedule that I didn't even really have in the first place. So I already filmed this once, but then I sounded really nervous and I was just like, no one can know that I have feelings. So like I, here I am again to try to film this the second time. But anyways, today is going to be talk about one book in particular, kind of give my thoughts on it, um, and hear what y'all have to say about it as well. You can tell from this right here, Girls of Paper and Fire uh, by Natasha Nyan. And I have a lot of feelings about it. But I'll warn you that I am terrible at dividing up between non-spoilery and spoilery stuff. So like, I'm warning you now, like, there are gonna be spoilers just throughout this video because I am not organized enough to not be that way. But any summary of it is that there are, there is this world that between, it's essentially a caste system and demons and they are ruled by a demon king who kind of presides over the entire land. And there is the lowest class, the third class, which are the humans or the paper caste. And in the middle, in sort of the second class, it's this weird hybrid combination demon-human people, and they're called the Steel Cast. So, um, the Demon King, every year, chooses eight paper cast women uh, and girls to be his servants, specifically his concubines. And there are always eight, but the main character in this book is chosen as the ninth because she has very unique eyes, um, which is apparently going to be significant later, but it's not really in this book, who cares, whatever. Um, so anyway, she has her own reasons for being there, um, but it's not consensual by any means, so there are going to be content warnings on this book if you're interested in reading it for sexual assault and abuse. Um, and what is essentially racism and slut shaming in this as well, but there is a content warning. I have a lot of feelings about this and it can really be boiled down to yes, but more. <laughs> because there are so many things about this book and things that in theory I am all about, like the diversity, yes. A female-female romance, very yes, I am here for that concubines or the servants or what have you just having like a pack of girls and women yes I'm here for that like all of those things are things that I would really love in a story um and those things were good some of them better than others they were decent but I wanted a little bit more from it and I'll get into some more particulars here so I'll jump into kind of the world building a little bit uh, in interviews, Natasha Neon talks about how it's heavily based on Malaysia because she um, grew up in the UK but has like Malaysian roots and it's a very diverse culture and there's a lot to bring that to the book, which I very much appreciate. I love that so much. And um, the world building itself, like it was a good start to the world building and kind of seeing some of like hints of that kind of colonialism um, and just the random stuff that the main culture has picked up from its minority cultures across the land. Um, they made mention of certain foods and certain dress and things like that that were really cool to just see, you know, those little nuggets in the story itself. So I did enjoy that quite a bit. I just wanted to see more of like how like all of that interacted together. I do want to jump into the characters in this one as well because that kind of also fell into the yes but more category. Um, specifically Lei, because she had all kinds of potential to be, like, this really intense and very, very hurt and upset, like, just a very interesting character dealing with a lot, uh, just because of the circumstances that she finds herself in. But she didn't have a whole lot of personality. I mean, there were certain things that you know, would keep being brought up in the book about, like, how she wants to stay so that, you know, for her family's safety, so that they aren't hurt. She doesn't really have any other interests <laughs> other than just being alive. 
and like she isn't good at any of the classes that they take her through like to be one of the concubines um just nothing really clicks with her she doesn't want to be there which is fair but like the only things we know about her are the city that she comes from her mother was kidnapped and she helped to run her father's store and that's it that's what her whole personality is built on I did really enjoy her love interest, Ren. Um, Ren is very reserved. She's not necessarily making a big attempt to get to know the other girls. She's very kind of a loner. Um, but as you do get to know her, and she does open up a little bit better, like she, she steals like this softness and this passion at the same time to, I mean, you find out why later, but like, She's very skilled. She's very interested in, like, using um, her body and movement. Uh, she's very good at dance. And, like, you just get a lot from Ren that you don't really get from Lang. Most of the paper girls, most of them you don't really get a whole lot. They're, like, one-dimensional. Like, Aoki was interesting. And I am curious to see where her arc goes. But, like, it wasn't developed as much as I would like. Um, and the same with Blue, she was very, she could be very interesting, um, but it would need to be developed in further books, and it looks like this is going to be a series, so I'm excited for that. That I would want to see more of is like a, a different sort of pacing, just because at the very beginning, whenever Lei is taken, they spend like a chapter or two just getting to the palace area that didn't really need to be there, like, and just little things like that. And when she does get there, they're going through classes, and, I mean, and all of that is interesting, but not all of that furthered the plot. So, like, I loved seeing those classes and things like that, but I also want to see, like, how that furthers her story. And especially in interactions with Ren, so much of those interactions are off the page. So all of a sudden, she and Ren get really close, and you're just like, wait, where did that come from? So it, it would be kind of a slow burn ro romance if it were listed on the page. But because it just kind of happened all of a sudden, you're just like, what? Like, are y'all a thing now? Like, y'all like each other and are friends now? Okay, cool. Um, but again, like, that's something that it is Natasha Mion's first book, and it's still, like, a decent story and a decent book. Um and some of the scenes in here were so beautiful, especially with Ren and Lei. Uh, there's a scene in the bathhouse whenever they're like first getting together that had so much potential. Um, and it was very good uh, until Blue came along, but we're not going to talk about that. But like, that was so well crafted. I really enjoyed that scene a lot. Um, I enjoyed whenever they go to the temple, and I guess there's an area at the temple where there's like a tree that has the names of people that uh, they are mourning for, and that scene was gorgeous, it was beautiful, and I'm just like, more of this, please. <laughs> so, um, I, yes, but more. On pretty much every aspect of this book, yes, but more. So there are some things that haven't really been explored or wrapped up, and it is a series, so like, that's fair. It doesn't all need to be wrapped up right now. Um, but I am curious, because it's called Girls of Paper and Fire, like, I want to know what significance that has. Like, if Lei is, like, wreaking havoc on this kingdom or whatever because of the things that have happened to her um, and with her and because of her, like, I want to see that. I also want to know what the significance is of the necklace that they keep talking about and mentioning several times, but... I don't really see its significance just yet. Like, in the beginning, it seems like it's going to be really significant, but it's hardly ever mentioned, like, in the bulk of the book until the very end. Um, and then it's just like, okay, like, great. <laughs> One other thing that I would like to see is just some visualization of uh, the different casts themselves, because it's very hard for me to picture, like, this kind of humanoid animal demon like because to my understanding like they walk on two legs like they are it, it's almost like Arthur except not like Arthur at all <laughs> but basically there are all these animals walking on their hind legs and like they're really gorgeous very animal like but also like very like 
very human at the same time in that way. And I just, it's hard for me to picture what that would look like IRL. Um, and then you have the weird, like, demon-human hybrids and, like, how some of them are cat-like or part eagle or what have you. And, like, she'll describe it. And it's not that the descriptions are bad by any means. It's just something that I have a hard time visualizing. So hopefully they'll include, like, pictures <laughs> or drawings or something in the next book so that I can take a look. Just so that it's, for me personally, it's something that I can get past and I can get more invested into the story. So this one altogether, I gave three stars because it it laid a foundation to build on for the rest of the series. And while the the book itself wasn't necessarily my favorite, it was a good start. It was something that I, I mean, I would read the second book. Give it to me. <laughs> it pretty much summarizes all of my thoughts on Girls of Paper and Fire by Natasha Neon. Um, if anyone really loves this book or really hates this book, please talk about it in the comments with me. I am curious to hear your thoughts. Um, bye, I guess. I don't know. See you later.